Welcome everyone to the Math Rebbe. I'm your host, Sunil. This has to be my favorite episode so far. Playing with triangles is a lot more fun than you'd think. Using trigonometry, we're going to analyze a Gemara and Irvin regarding Robin Gamliel's telescope and other um, similar calculations. Then comes the part where we block out the sun. So Rabbi Gamliel and a few other Tanaim were on a boat once upon a time. Rabbi Gamliel had this telescope, which he used to be able to figure out when he and his fellow Tanaim had entered the Tchum of the mainland, in order to know when they were allowed to exit the boat. Seriously, I thought I got rid of this star already. There, now I'll show you. Anyway, here's the math behind how his telescope worked. Given the height of the deck off the water in Amos, plus the height of the telescope off the deck in Amos, who some will call H, the line extending downward from the telescope, perpendicular to the one extending outward from the shoreline, will be 2,000 Amos from the shore, if and only if the distance from the telescope lens to the shore is the square root of the sum of 2,000 squared and H squared, by the Pythagorean theorem. Given that this triangle is a right triangle, the angle by the telescope will measure the arc tangent of 2,000 over h, and the angle by the shore, the angle of elevation, will measure 90 minus arc tangent of 2,000 over h. For example, if the telescope is held 6 amus off the water, the distance from the telescope lens to the shore won't be that much farther than 2,000 amus it is horizontally. The angle must be held is 89.83 degrees, and the angle of elevation will therefore be 0.17 degrees. Another example, if the telescope is on a modern-day cruise liner, which measure about 200 feet tall or 100 amos on average, the hypotenuse of the triangle would increase to 2,002.5 amos. The angle of the telescope drops to 87.14 degrees, and the angle of elevation increases accordingly to 2.86 degrees. The Gemara continues with three cases, the depth of the pit, the height of the tree, and the height of the gravestone. We'll be talking about the first two of these, as the case of the gravestone is essentially the same as the tree. To say that you want to measure the depth of a pit, you could take the same telescope Reverend Gamaliel had, figure out the distance from the middle of the pet and the distance to the middle bottom of the pet and using the Pythagorean theorem you can find the height of the pet. Now say that you want to find the height of a tree. You can use your own height to solve this. Let's denote the height of the tree as h sub t and the length of its shadow as s sub t and we'll denote the height of the person as h sub p and the shadow of the person as S sub P. From here, it's a similar triangles issue. Since it's the same time of day, all angles are the same. By angle, angle, angle theorem, that means the two triangles are similar, and similar parts of similar triangles are proportional. Thus, the ratio of the respective heights equals the ratio of the respective shadow lengths. Rearranging the equation, that means that the height of the tree is the length of the tree's shadow times your height divided by the length of your shadow. There's a rule of Ervin that a sloped hill, a tel hamislakate, is considered a rishus hayachad, a private domain, if and only if it slopes four amos for every ten tefachim. Everyone agrees that the ten tefachim refers to the height of the slope, but what is a four amos? The Shulchan Aruch says it refers to the horizontal distance, that is, a rise of 10 tefachim for a run of 24, or a slope of 5 over 12. What is the incline angle? Taking the inverse tangent of 10 over 24, we get 22.62. The Rama argues, he holds that the 24 tefachim are on the diagonal. To him, the incline angle is the inverse sine of 10 over 24, or 24.62 only two degrees steeper. The Mishabrua explains that the argument is at what point is it no longer called easy to climb and starts becoming more of a hike. These two poskim have quite a few rabbanim on their sides. The Shulchan Aruch is backed by the Merkevesa Mishnah, the Orsameach, and the Chazanesh. 
at the Ramah is supported by the Ritzva, the Gon Am, and the Mar Bach. The Dirshu Mishnah Brua infers from the Shulchan Aruch later that he holds like the Ramah there, even though he disagrees here. The Gemara and Madrash mention a place called the Hari Choshach. We don't know exactly where these mountains are, but we do know several things about them. We know that they're in Africa, that it's always dark due to blocking out the sun all year, and that beyond the mountain range is a city of wise women called Kartinda. We also know that the ten tribes were exiled there. To figure out how it's possible to block out the sun, we need to first understand the trigonometry of the sun and the earth. The solar elevation angle, also called the altitude angle, is the angle of the sun in the sky. This is the arc sign of a bunch of different terms, which we'll examine one by one. The first variable, that looks like a little circle with a little squiggly on top, is a lowercase delta, the declination angle. This represents the angle between the sun and the equator. It's not always zero, because the Earth's axis is tipped. Also because of the axial tip, this angle can be at most 23.45 degrees. It's no coincidence that this number is also used as a latitude for the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. As a corollary to this being the maximum elevation angle, it's also the farthest north that the sun can reach directly overhead and the farthest south. As this is a function of the time of year, this is corrected using B. The negative 81 is included because the spring equinox is the 81st day of the year. The next variable, which looks like a 6 on its side and a line sticking out of the bottom, is a lowercase phi, and it represents latitude. Positive is north of the equator, and negative is south of the equator. HRA stands for hour angle. This converts the solar time into an angle. Lower, uh, local solar time equ equals the local time plus 1 60th TC, the, the time correction factor, minus 12. The time correction factor corrects things due to time zone issues, movement of the sun 4 degrees in the sky every minute, hence that 4 suck in there, and Earth's imperfect orbit and axial tilt. This once again takes into account the time of year. Now keep in mind that the mountains cannot possibly be between the tropics. If it's anywhere between 23.45 north and south, the sun will be directly overhead at least once during the year, something that couldn't happen in a place that's dark all year. To give you an example of why, let's take Mount Stanley in the middle of Congo's Ruanzari range as an example. Its coordinates are 0 degrees north, 30 degrees east. Apparently, solar noon around the mountain actually is roughly local noon, so for argument's sake, I'll use that number. B, the correction for the time of year, comes out to 89.75. Plugging that into the time correction factor yields negative 241.45. Plugging that into the hour angle yields negative 60.36. Plugging B into the declination angle yields 23.45. You'll notice this doesn't make a difference. We started with 23.5, multiplied it by the sine of 90, or 1, and took an undid sign. Taking our hour angle and declination angle and plugging them into our final formula, we end up with a grand total of 26.98 degrees. Now, it's not very high up in the sky. At that time of year, the mountains could easily block it out. But this is on the equator. On the equinoxes, the sun is directly overhead. No mountain range could block that out. So in theory, the mountains would have to be significantly south of the equator or significantly north. That means that the mountains would have to be those of Morocco, Algeria, or South Africa, the only mountains in Africa outside the tropics. But even so, they're not tall enough to block out the sun. So that means one of three things, all of which are equally likely. A. The Gemara is exaggerating or the story is metaphorical. B. The mountains have drastically eroded. Or C, Chazal had a drastically different definition of Africa, for which parts of Asia or even Europe are included. All of these are possible. The Gemara often exaggerates, and Midrashim don't have to be taken literally so much as trying to teach us a lesson. The Gemara refers to Har Tavor as the tallest mountain in the times of Mount Man Torah, yet the mountain is tiny in comparison to, say, Everest. And even nowadays, the definition of the, of the continents varies. There are those who recognize a Africa, Asia, and Europe as a single continent and labeled Afro-Eurasia. If this is what the Gemara means by Africa, it would open up, say, the Himalayas as our Hari Choshech. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe, and comment. Over the next two videos, we'll be talking more about triangles, in which we'll discuss how Rashi seems to contradict the Pythagorean theorem.